I think it's time uh, we should start. So good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Achyut, president of CMJYT. So we thank all the attendees who have joined us today and welcome you all to the very first uh, seminar of the Distinguished Speaker Seminar Series by CMJYT, soon chapter. With the blessings from our Vice Chancellor, Professor Rajendra Kumar Sharma and Dean Academics and Research, Professor Ashok Kumar Gupta. We can, we'd like to start, commence this session. A special thanks to our founding faculty advisor, Professor Vivek Kumar Shagal, for always supporting us and in, encouraging us to take such initiatives. We would also like to express our gratitude to Dr. Vivek Kumar Agarwal and President Shagun Appal of CM Delhi Technical University, who have been a great help to our chapter. Now I'd like to hand it over to Ashima. Uh, she'll be hosting this event. Thanks, Achit. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ashima, Vice President of Siam JUIT, and I'll be the host for today's seminar. The Distinguished Speaker Seminar Series is one of the front-running events of Siam JUIT, and this seminar marks the beginning of Siam JUIT activities at our university. This series is an initiative taken by the chapter to give you all the opportunity to gain wisdom, exposure, and experience directly from the best in academia and the industry. Before we begin, I would like to explain the procedure for the Q&A session of the seminar. You all are requested to drop your queries and questions to the speaker in the chat box, which will be filtered by our moderator and then forwarded to the speaker for him to answer them. You all are directed not to try to use your microphones as it would cause disturbance and only utilize the chat box feature of the platform. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Mark Esculante, distinguished research staff member and manager of Foundations of Probability, Dynamics and Control at IBM Research, speaking on decision-making under uncertainty. He also served as the director of the Center for Optimization under uncertainty research across IBM Research and has been an adjunct facu faculty member in the School of Operations Research and Information Engineering at Cornell Tech and the School of Engineering and Applied Science at Columbia University and a member of the technical staff at Bell Telephone Laboratories. He's an elected fellow of INFORM's ACM, IEEE, AAIA and has authored more than 300 technical publications and has more than 70 issued patents under his name. His work has been recognized through the Best Publication in Applied Probability Award, Informs Applied Probability Society, the, da the Daniel Lich Warner Prize, Informs, the Gold Stevie Awards, Sales Automation Solution, nine Best Paper Awards, 17 keynote presentations, 27 major IBM Technical Awards, and 40 IBM Invention Awards. He is a member of AAAS, AMS, Bernoulli Society for Mathematical Statistics and Probability, DAMAX, IMS, IFIP, WG 7.3, and CAM, also being elected to serve as chair of IFIP WG 7.3 and as chair of the Computer Performance Foundation. He is currently serving as the editor in chief of Stochastic Models and has served on the editorial boards of Operations Research performance evaluation, and transactions on the modeling and performance evaluation of computing science systems. He has also chaired several international conferences in stochastic processes, applied probability, stochastic optimization, and control and relation related applications. So we welcome you and are grateful that you could find your time in your busy schedule for this seminar. Over to you now, sir. Uh, first, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind in, uh, introduction. And I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's a great honor, and, and it's my pleasure to speak to you today. Um, let me just suggest to the moderator, if uh, I'm happy to take questions at the end, but if something's not clear and, and it would be better for me to clarify for, before moving on, please do interrupt. I'm happy to handle questions uh, as we go. So I'd like to speak to you today about decision-making under uncertainty. And before I get into certain problems in this area, and get into uh, solutions, I'd like to motivate things because I think sometimes this can be helpful and I want to highlight the importance of decision-making under uncertainty. Let me start with a Harvard Business Review report. Now this is a relatively old report, 2014, but the title is very suggestive. The title is The Industries Plagued by the Most Uncertainty. And what was done in this report was to look at various industries across two dimensions. One being demand uncertainty, which is on the y-axis here. That's exactly what you would think, uh, uncertainty for the demand of your products. The other is technology uncertainty. It may sound like a strange way of characterizing it, but what they're referring to is the ability of the industry 
to provide the products or services that um, their customers want. And this is a log scale. And the key importance here is there are a tremendous number of, in of uh, industries plagued by uncertainty. Um, th uh, these, these industries listed here exhibit very high degrees of risk, volatility, and uncertainty. And I, I don't believe that uh, this has really changed anything um, since 2014. In fact, maybe with the pandemic and, and other factors, things have gotten even worse uh, with events around the world. And so um, decision-making under uncertainty, which I'll refer to as DMUU, uh, these solutions attempt to manage the impact of the risks, the volatility, and the uncertainty for these industries. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Mark. Yes. Your screen is paused, so can you just reshare your screen? Oh, sure. Okay, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, it is visible. Okay. And so, uh, what was this, uh, th this, uh, the point of this slide clear? Should I go on or? Uh, I think the screen is still paused. Uh... Your PPTs are not visible, Mark. Can you share the PPTs instead of the whole screen? That's the problem. It's not giving me the opportunity to share that uh, application. Uh, can you just, uh, I, I, we can see your cursor moving. So can you just uh, uh, basically uh, uh, change to some other tab? Because we can see that you have opened Google Meet and it is visible. Can you just move to any another tab so we can see it is working? Uh, I see you have uh, email in other tab. Oh, so you're seeing other things. Um, can you just move to any other tab so, so that we can see if it's working? Do you see the Zoom window here? Uh -huh. uh, we can see the mute window. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe if I uh, uh, declutter my uh, things yep, that are yep. open, it'll, th this will help. Let's see. Okay, so now, are you seeing my presentation? No, we can see your console where you have opened Google Meet. Okay, so now let's see. You see, the problem is, I don't know if you're seeing what my pull down is, it's not showing PowerPoint as one of the things I can select. Sir, are you uh, are you sharing uh, the whole screen, the entire screen? I, I was, yes. Okay. Let me try again. Uh, so you can also email me the presentation, and I can share the same, and we'll work it out accordingly, if possible. Sure. Hold on. Give me a second, then. Are you seeing my screen? No, sir, we can't see it. Okay. Not All right, so now let me. Okay.
Okay, the presentation should have been sent. Okay. And then I'll just view what you have on the screen and, and uh, speak to that once you have it. Sure, sure. Achit, have you received the mail? Uh, not, uh, not right now, sir. Just give me one minute. Is it visible now? Yes, it is. So we can okay. go to the next chart. Sure. Now, now did, was was this something that was uh, covered, or should I go through it again? Uh, you should go through it again because you couldn't see sure. a thing. Sure. So what I was talking about here is this Gartner report from 2014 that was entitled The Industries Plagued by the Most Industries. Each of the dots here are uh, specific industries. The y-axis is demand uncertainty. Again, uncertainty for the demand of your products or services. The x-axis is what they referred to as technology uncertainty. It's uncertainty around the ability of the industry to produce services and products that the, their uh, audience or their, their base is interested in. And this is a log scale. So these are the, the industries that are, are uh, um, there's a, a, the point here is there's a very large number of industries that are plagued by uncertainty and distributionally uh, uh, dis, uh, decision making under uncertainty, or I'll refer to it as DMUU. Solutions will attempt to, will, will help address the risks, volatility, and uncertainty for these industries. Go to the next chart, please. About a year later, there was a Gartner report, and Gartner produces what are called hype uh, uh, cycles. And um, what is listed here on, uh, you can see that uh, things like predictive analytics, machine learning, these uh, industries or technologies have reached a level of maturation. Uh, they're very prevalent today, so we know that um, these haven't gone away, and I don't think this hype curve has really changed because everybody continues to focus on developing predictive models and applying machine learning, which is a good thing. But that only goes so far. That helps us understand the uncertainty, the risks, the volatility. It doesn't help us with the decision-making part. And that's where prescriptive analytics and optimization are technologies on the rise that will help us in developing decision-making under uncertainty solutions. Go to the next chart, please. There was a subsequent uh, um, Gartner report in 2016. Now, this is 2015, 2016, but frankly, with the uh, pandemic and everything else that's going on, uncertainty has only gotten worse, um, and it's only become more difficult for industries. And um, so I think even though these are somewhat older reports, I think they're still relevant, which is why I wanted to speak to them. But this particular report literally chastised executives. Uh, telling them that they were making decisions using intuition um, and they were significantly underestimating risk in the decisions that they were making. Um, it, it explained that even though they may be using data and analytics, they're really not using that effectively and they're making the decisions with their, their gut intuition um, and they're just trying to do things quickly as opposed to properly. Um, and then even those that embrace decision uh, data-driven decision-making the focus is on point estimates and not um, probability distribution. So the example I would use there is, let us imagine that I told you the one option has an expected reward of $100 million plus or minus $200 million. And another option was $90 million plus or minus $5 million. If I just give you the $100 million and the $90 million as the average, I'm really not telling you the full story. And this is, this is a business or organization chastising executives for taking such approaches and arguing that they need to use 
more sophisticated me methods to capture the risks and, uh, and the uncertainty. Next chart, please. So what I would like to uh, say, and, and what my focus is here, is that from both a business and a technology perspective, there are huge opportunities for DMUU technologies and solutions to help business, to help uh, science, to help engineering. And what we're attempting to do is provide a scientific basis that includes fundamental research in the relevant fields of mathematics to address the various challenges of DMUU solutions. Our goal is to be famous for our science. This is something that goes years back in IBM research, but at the same time have significant impact in practice in terms of solving real world problems. And I believe that the end result will be better decisions and strategies that truly revolutionize business, science, society, and many aspects of our world. Next chart, please. To address this, we have developed what we consider a general approach to decision making under uncertainty problems. And this general framework or approach consists of first developing a model of the system or the problem of interest under uncertainty and risks. Whatever that problem might be, it could be a supply chain problem, it could be any of the problems that uh, any of the, the problems of the industries that were listed earlier. And then given this mathematical or formal representation of the problem, it captures the uncertainties and risks. We seek to derive the optimal solution, the optimal decision-making under uncertainty solution, uh, if possible, or to derive properties of the solution or certain results um, that are relevant. And then sometimes the solution needs to be computed, or even if it's derived explicitly, there may be needs for efficient algorithms to capture uh, th that solution. And so what I'd like to do is two illustrative examples is uh, describe uh, one example related to networks under uncertainty. Uh, I'll cover that first um, and speak to simulation optimization of these problems. And the second example, if there's time permitting, uh, go through a stochastic optimal control problem. But in each of these cases, data analytics and learning is being used to determine the model, its policy, its parameters, its policies, and how those can be adjusted over time. Are there any, let me stop here to see if there are any questions before going through the first example. Okay, you can go to the next chart, please. So this example will be simulation optimization of stochastic networks, and I'll go through several instances of this so that you can have in your mind a specific application that's driving the work that we're uh, going to be describing. This is joint work with uh, Tom Deeker, who's at Columbia University, and my colleague at IBM Research, Shomadeep uh, Ghosh. Next chart, please. So let's consider a hospital uh, emergency room. Um, this is a situation where customers arrive, they check in, and then uh, with certain probabilities based upon data, they either directly see a doctor or they see a nurse. Uh, after seeing a doctor, maybe they leave or they get admitted to the hospital. After seeing a nurse, maybe they see a doctor. But the key point here is this infrastructure and patient flow through the emergency room is translated into a network and it's a network that's stochastic because the arrival times, the probabilistic routing, the service times at each of the different stations, this is, these all have uncertainties that are captured by probability distributions. And the objective in this class of problems is determine what is the resource capacity at each of the stations in order to balance a trade-off or optimize a trade-off between financial factors such as costs and revenue, and performance, in this case, the delay in serving patients and uh, lives, health uh, issues. And the resources here are human in nature, making it even more complicated in terms of how they behave. There are, uh, there's another example, I'll talk about service delivery centers. There, we, we understand from the data that human resources tend to operate more efficiently and take less time to do the same task when the load is heavy. 
So in other words, when there's long waiting lines, people will, the doctors, the nurses, they'll, they'll, they'll not lower the quality. They'll, they'll continue to do what needs to be done, but they'll do it more efficiently. Whereas if there's nobody waiting online, maybe the doctor asks how your, your family is doing or there's other things and the service time is elongated, which uh, again, another form of uncertainty making things even more complicated. Next chart, please. Business processes. Now, I'm not sure if people are familiar with the notion of business processes. It's essentially just the steps in a business process. So for example, medical claims that are processed by an insurance company, they would go through certain steps, certain stations, certain tasks along the way. Inventory and supply chain management. Manufacturing processing. These are where you have very, very large numbers of steps that need to be processed with uh, random arrival times, random service times. And so the number of nodes, there can be hundreds or even thousands of nodes in a real world uh, business process. But once again, we map this business process onto a stochastic network. One example is illustrated in the upper right. And this captures the dynamics and the uncertainties and the risks associated with the resource capacity planning problem. The trade-off is between cost and revenue and delay, and there could be service level agreements in which certain things need to be done by a certain time. Next chart, please. Cloud and data centers. Again, another situation in where the computing infrastructure is mapped onto a stochastic network. Here is just a very simple example with a front end web server, an app server, a database server. But of course, it can get much more complicated with GPUs and other things that exist in today's uh, cloud data centers. The trade off here is again between the costs and revenue on the financial side and the performance in terms of delays and service level contractual agreements. Next chart, please. And the last example that I'll give, and hopefully this is making it clear, that there are many, many different problems in the world where decisions need to be made. In particular, what should my staffing levels be for different types of resources? Um, the problem is, is mapped onto a stochastic network where the stochasticities are capturing the random, the, the uncertainties and the risks associated with the problem. Um, but this is a particularly interesting one. Service level delivery centers or you can think of them as call centers, but elevated because the types of calls that are coming in are more technical in nature and require more expertise than in maybe a traditional call center. But again, the problems here, here you have issues with geographically distributed service locations supporting different classes of service. Uh, you have different teams of agents with different skill levels, different levels of expertise. So these problems are very, very complicated. And what we're seeking to develop are, dis are solutions to help aid the decision making under uncertainty. Let me make one other point clear, at least in the terms of our work. I'm not, of course, if the problem is well understood and the solutions are extremely uh, well validated, then it could be an automated solution. The solution could actually be used without human intervention. But most of what I'll be talking about here, and I think some of the examples I've described, really we're talking about developing tools to help individuals, humans, make decisions with the best information that they, they have at their hands. And in particular, there might be things, maybe there's a forecast on the arrivals of calls into the service delivery center, and that's our best understanding. But what if something happens where things are dramatically lower than we expect or dramatically higher. You can use the capabilities I'm describing as an interactive tool to do what if scenarios and to gain insight and then decide what is the best solution to deploy. Next chart, please. So now I'm going to go into a more formal characterization. And I'll, again, I'll keep this at a high level, but for those that are more uh, familiar with the area, we will try to touch on the, the key technical points. Um, before I do so, are there any questions on the examples or the class of problems we're looking at here? Yeah, Mark, sorry to interrupt in between. Uh, am I audible? I can yes, hear you. Okay. Uh, 
because stochastic network we have shown you over here. So uh, I feel this is a bit replication of uh, the Markovian models. Uh, is it, it is suitable for the congestion control? Um, it, it can be used for congestion control. It need not be Markovian. And one of the points I want to make is um, that you, let's use this data center example in the right hand side here. Um, it, it, we can have a very complex arrival process and service process. There can be correlations between arrivals and service. It need not be um, Markovian. And one of the reasons that uh, I guess the, it, it, the, the title for this is simulation optimization. One of the reasons simulation is used is that it's not possible to actually solve these queuing networks uh, analytically one needs to use simulation and once you go down the path of simulation i can make it as complex and as integrate in um uh, as, as uh, complex and as uh, specific as you like so that that's an important point can it be used for congestion control absolutely it can be used for any problem where there's a stochastic network uh the problems i'm going to be looking at here are ones in which the decisions we're trying to make are the capacities at the individual nodes. But I think you can adapt it. In fact, we have adapted this approach for other types of problems. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Mark? Yes. Dr. Mark, we have one more question by Dr. Sugandha. I will just see the question. For data centers, does the stochastic networks take into account non-structural components, such as sprinkler piping systems, whose failure which could jeopardize the equipment? No, I think that's an excellent question, and, and I think the answer is related to the answer to the previous question. Because we're going to be using simulation optimization, um, or, or, or uh, this, the network is going to be analyzed for a given set of capacities via simulation, it can be as complex as is needed. Um, what I would say um, is that what I think happens a lot of times is people develop very, very detailed simulation models. And then it can be difficult to interpret the results. So what I like to suggest in problems like this is first start off with, as the gentleman uh, in the first question asked, let's start off with the Markovian uh, model. It's not accurate. It's, it, uh, and, and let's not include all the details. Let's solve that problem. And then let's add increasingly more detail to our simulation model and in doing so we will have a much more insight into why the optimal solution is uh, as given by the the solver so that that's just a, a side comment that I, I at least in the work we do we try to start with simple models solve them don't use those solutions but understand and gain insight with the simple model and then add more and more complexity. And yes, you can get down to the point where it includes very detailed aspects of the, the cloud data center. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. You're, you're most welcome. So we're going to be, so, so if you want to keep the picture of uh, the, the, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, let me mention one other thing. The, the, mo net the networks I'm going to be looking at here, there are no losses. The queues can grow uh, arbitrarily large. We have adopted, however, the same approach where there are losses. So it's a loss system. The approach is somewhat different. Well, no, the approach is the same. The details are somewhat different. But again, in both cases, we're using simulation optimization. And so the way simulation optim let me let me uh, uh, well let me let me just describe the model and then I'll I'll talk about how it's typically solved. So in, uh, I, I don't want to get into heavy detail on the notation, but it 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 could be helpful for those that are familiar with this area. There are going to be L stations. There's an arrival rate to each node of gamma i. This is an effective arrival rate because it's possible that um, the departure from a node is split. Uh, probabilistically, as we see out from the front end web server, it could also be that there's a feedback loop so that uh, something from uh, one node comes into another node and, and the output. So, so the input to a node can actually be from multiple sources. So gamma I is the effective arrival rate, the combined arrival rate. 
the the objective is going to be to minimize the weighted sum of the q lengths now the reason why we focus on q lengths because we really are interested in delays we can translate the problem of delays into a problem of steady state q lengths using little's law so from now on i'm going to be talking about q lengths but again it, it's connected directly to uh delays via little's law um i'll just leave it at that and for those that aren't familiar with little's law um you you can look it up or or i'm, I'm it, it's a very simple concept um but the problem is to determine the uh the service rates which essentially uh, affect the capacities in each of the nodes uh so this beta vector beta represents the vector of the service uh, uh rates and zi is the steady state q lengths under the entire vector beta now the reason why the q lengths are a function of the entire vector is if i make an upstream node uh, add more capacity there so that it processes things faster that actually influences the arrival rate to a downstream node so it's not just about the service rate at the node it, it is affected by the service rates at other nodes and in particular, what makes this problem hard to solve? I mentioned simulation. The reason why we have to use simulation here is because we know the service uh, uh, information at each node. Now, of course, if there's correlation, that makes it more complicated. But um, the, the point is we know the service information at each of the node. It's a function of the service rates we determine. Um, the problem is, the arrivals to each of the nodes are things that we don't know. So we can know the entire service distribution, but it's the arrival rates that are affected by everything else that's going on in the node. And that's why we need to simulate the, the system. The other points I'll just mention is we assume that there's a coefficient of variation for, um, uh, the, the, so there's the service rates coefficient of variation, and there's also a transition probability matrix that just describes the rate of flow from node I to node J. Go to the next chart, please. So the typical approach uh, for solving this, many of you may be familiar with stochastic gradient descent. It's, it's become very, very popular in the machine learning world. That's the type of approach that is typically used. One simulates the system, one computes a gradient of the objective function for the beta sup n, that, in other words, the vector beta for the nth iteration, and one uses a step size, and one adjusts the beta for the nth plus first iteration based on the beta for the nth uh, district, uh, the iteration, and a small step in the, the direction of the gradient. And then you might need to project that back onto the proper system. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an approach that can work well, um, the problem is it treats the stochastic network as a black box. And frankly, we know a lot more about the stochastic network and treating it as a black box is eliminating a lot of useful information that is actually available to us. There's also parameters one needs to tune the, uh, the stochastic approximation or stochastic gradient descent, if you like. What should the step size be? It's something that should start out may be relatively large and get smaller as n increases. The steady state estimation is something that one wants to run this system for a very, very long time uh, in terms of simulating the system. And um, th then there's this notion of a parameter for the finite difference to estimate the gradient. So this is how it's typically done. It can be extremely expensive. I'll just mention to you real quick one of my colleagues used um, a simulation package and the optimization capability there for a very, very simple stochastic network, and it took 24 hours to run. Now, remember, I mentioned to you earlier, you'd like to use these tools uh, under different scenarios. So if I have to wait an entire day to run each scenario, it's not very effective. And so what we're trying to do is develop a solution that allows you to get answers back very, very quickly, and then it allows you to look at multiple scenarios and gain insight. So let's go to the next uh, chart, please. So our approach it consists of two phases. The first phase is to use an analytical approximation 
to speed up the that that convergence because the the number of simulations we run and the type of simulations we need to run are much more efficient i'll explain that in more detail in a second the second thing is when we're actually very, very close to the optimal solution, we can then use the standard stochastic approximation approach. But at that point, we're already within a few percentage points of optimal. So the analytical approach we use is based upon uh, the intuition of the curve on the right hand, upper right hand side. If you look at Q lengths as a function of the, uh, the traffic intensity, the arrival rate, as the arrival rate gets closer to the service rate, the, 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 the queue length or the delay actually starts to blow up. So this functional form suggests to us that um, uh, a, a, an, an estimation for the queue length of some parameter tau divided by beta i minus gamma i. Remember, beta i is the service rate, gamma i is the arrival rate. So the denominator, as the arrival rate gets closer to the service rate, this is something that blows up. Uh, you might have seen uh, in different formulations, the denominator equivalently could be written as one minus rho, where rho is the utilization. As the utilization gets close to one, the, the Q length blows up. So we're assuming a functional form that for every uh, station in the network, the expected the Q length is tau divided by beta i minus gamma i. That really should be tau sub i because it's the i node. Now, there's actually um, heavy traffic uh, justification for this. In fact, in heavy traffic, we know what the value of tau is. It's listed there for a single Q. But the point I want to make is we are now going to use this tau divided by beta i minus gamma i as the approximation. And so the idea is to rewrite the objective function that's down below where we replace the expected z, uh, q length for at node i for a given beta vector by this uh, tau i divided by beta i minus gamma i for that same data. Next chart, please. Thank you. So the only point I want to make here is it's well known that if I know the values of tau, I can analytically determine what the optimal service rates are at each node. Next chart. So the idea is that we, the, the details are here. What I want to just convey is the following. We are going to simulate the system with, say, some arbitrary set of, of tau's to begin with. From that, we actually determine, oh, sorry, we're going to simulate the system with a given set of capacities for each of the nodes. The simulation will then give us values for tau at each of the nodes. Given the values of tau, we can then determine the optimal capacities for that tau. Then we simulate that system with those capacities, and then we obtain a new tau. Now, there's two advantages of this. One is the simulation we're doing is getting an estimator for tau. So it's an, a steady state estimator. That's very efficient compared with the case in which you're simulating for gradients which is much more expensive. But the second point is we can analytically determine what the optimal capacities are once we know tau. So the way our approach works is using this uh, 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 analytical approximation, we can speed up the number of iterations because in a few iterations, we're actually close to optimal and each iteration is much more efficient than in the classical approach. You can scroll forward. I think I'll go through the next ones relatively quickly. Yes, you can skip this. Uh, the only thing I'll mention here real quick, which was quite interesting, uh, is that we found that a particular way of solving the, the fixed point iterations um, wound up re rediscovering an old result by Mann in 1953, in which 
if we solve the problem directly as opposed to using a form of averaging, um, the solution was not guaranteed to converge or it would oscillate. Um, but if we use the form of averaging, which is what's described in the upper part with the square root, um, it actually uh, is guaranteed to converge. And it was just nice to see recovering a result from the 1950s. Next chart, please. So I think I've described this. The approach consists of um, having our, our objective function be written in terms of these tau's, replacing the tau with the simulation of the system for a given beta uh, uh, n at the nth iteration, a uh, solve for the optimal capacities to get the beta for the n plus first iteration, repeat, and again, one obtains the solution with just a few iterations, and um, one is simulating function estimates as opposed to gradients, which are much more expensive. Uh, and there's no parameter tweaking. There's no step size. There's no issues here. We found that a solution is extremely robust with respect to the parameters of the problem. Next chart. Uh, so we actually proved some results. I'll just mention real quickly. We proved that the, the, in the context of Brownian tree networks, that there exists a fixed point for our first phase iteration, that the fixed point is, is unique, and that um, our iterative process is guaranteed to converge to this fixed point. And we even have an optimality gap for, for the result. So theoretically, this is rich. For those that are interested in the more mathematical side, there's a rich, rich uh, set of problems to solve here. Um, and those that are more interested on the practical side, these methods and these tools give you the ability to solve real world hard problems. Next chart. Dr. Mark, I would like yes, to please. share. Uh, we have some questions and uh, the, uh, the most important one that I'd like to ask right now is that, can you please explain what beta is again? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Beta is the, so beta sub i is the service rate at node i or station i in the network. Bold beta is the vector of service rates for all of the stations. And beta soup n was the service rate vector for the nth iteration, if you want to go back a chart. One more. Yes, here. So the bold beta is the um, the the rate of the service rate at all of the stations. And the reason why the the Q length at station I is a function of the entire vector of beta is, as I said before, I could increase or decrease the service rate at an upstream node and that will impact the downstream node. So that's why the expected Q length at any station is a function of the entire uh, service rate vector. Does that clarify? Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other question? Um, we do have some questions right now. So uh, we can take a few of them. Sure. How should we select the weights in the objective function? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very good uh, question. So, for example, imagine um, we're looking at the hospital problem, um, and you might want to think of the and, and imagine that your objective is in terms of cost. You could think that the uh, doctors are more expensive than the nurses, and the nurses are more expensive than. Uh, um, it, say a nurse practitioner, um, or which is more expensive than say a clerk that handles paperwork. And so the weights could be related to the cost. Um, so, uh, or it could be to the revenue that's driven by that, that, the, those sets of resources. Okay, thank you so much. Now we have three more questions by Bhavya Sharma, and then we can move forward. Is there a range of optimal number of parameters where maybe having too many of them may lead to more problems than it solves, like perhaps in weather simulations? So I think that's a great question. And that's very much at the heart of the reason why I described starting with a very simple model and adding more and more complexity. 
what you may find out is that certain parameters really do not affect the solution um, or certain levels of complexity in your model do not affect the solution. Now, if it took 24 hours to obtain one solution, then it would be very difficult to try to look at the solution as a function of different parameter values or what parameters to include. So for example, if you find that the solution is insensitive to a parameter, then you can leave that out, for example. Leave that aspect of the problem out. So these type of uh, methods that are efficient allows you to explore that space. I think part of the answer to the question, which is a good one, is there's somewhat of an art here as well as a science. The math can help us understand the roles that the, that adding a parameter or ex excluding a parameter plays. The math can help us solve problems for different weights. But how we connect the weights to the real world problems or decide what parameters to include in, or not, I think what I'm describing gives you the tools, but in the end it's a judgment call that the human makes. This goes back to the point I made earlier about not necessarily aut using these solutions for automation, but rather helping the human make better decisions. Okay, thank you so much. Now the second question is, for stochastic networks, approximations may help guess future conditions of the system, but it isn't really possible to accurately predict it. Is this similar to chaotic systems where minute, minute variations in initial conditions may lead to widely different outcomes, or are they different? Well, uh, um, uh, no, I definitely think that is part of what can happen. Um, I, again, coming back to the idea of not just running the solver once and getting an answer and saying, okay, we're done, but actually using these tools to understand the entire landscape, to understand um, where those, uh, th those uh, phase transitions occur. So in certain parts of the solution space, maybe things be, are very well behaved and understood, but in other parts of the solution space, things are chaotic. And uh, again, I think these tools help us understand the different regions of the search space, which can include the type of behavior that you were asking about. Okay, doctor, just two more questions and then we'll move forward. Are the capacities of nodes predetermined? Or can they be manipulated as required? Or is this perhaps situation dependent? Really good question. Um, this particular problem is looking at just uh, what I would refer to as a stochastic optimization problem, where we're trying to figure out what are the capacities. Um, now, imagine that, uh, that as the day goes along, your demand is higher than you expected. Well, then you might want to run the tool and see whether it is worth bringing more resources in or not. But this is doing a one-time solution. There are versions of these type of problems where instead of getting a one-time solution, you're actually getting a control policy, which is what uh, arises in the second problem. And uh, before we end, I'll be sure to kind of highlight the differences. But this problem is more static. The second problem, I won't have time to go into detail, um, but I, I can send papers if you're interested. That, that's a problem where, where what you're getting is a policy that dynamically adjusts the decision and the resource allocation over time as conditions warrant. Thank you so much, sir. Now, the final question is, your opinion about Nassim Taleb's perspective of uncertainty and anti-fragality. Fragility. Sorry for that. I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the question. The, my, my opinion on what? It's opin your opinion about Nassim Taleb's perspective of uncertainty and anti fragility. Um, I, I don't think I could speak to that. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that uh, uh, to be able to, to speak, to give you an opinion. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. That, that's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, let's go to the next chart. Um, I think we'll go through this very quickly. Keep going. 
uh, keep, oh, the, this is just describing how we use a, a stochastic approximation. Once we're already close to the solution, we use stochastic approximation to, to uh, go get to the end. But let's go to the, the results. I think the next one. Okay, here. So this is the situation where we have uh, increasing weights, unordered weights, unit weights, and what we compare um, uh, it is the the time it takes, the number of iterations, and the actual time under our algorithm and stochastic uh, approximation. And the point here is we get uh, as much as two orders of magnitude improvement um, for uh, results that are within 2% of optimal uh, or even 1% of optimal for a very, very simple network in the lower right-hand corner. but as you go to larger and more complicated networks, the difference between them will continue to grow. So you're getting significant savings, even in a very small network, and our interests are in larger networks. Next uh, chart, please. Um, I, I, I guess the one point I want to make here, and then because I would like to go to the other example just quickly, is we've devised this two-phase uh, framework where we exploit um, analytical results to get a, a good approximation. And then it, when we're close to being uh, near optimal, uh, we, we use the full-blown uh, stochastic approximation approach. There's also something that for those that work in optimization, it's well known that when you're far away from the solution, you don't need to be very, very accurate. But as you get closer and closer to the optimal solution, you want to make sure your solution of the model is very accurate. The other point I want to make here is that uh, this principle at the bottom, a lot of times people focus on wanting to get very, very good approximations of the demand, very good predictive models. Uh, so predicting the uncertainty extremely well. Well, I want to point out here, if you're trying to make decisions, having a model that has the right curvature, in other words, the minimum occurs in the right place, is far more important than having a predictive model that is extremely accurate, but the curvature is such that it points you to the wrong solution. So let's go to the next chart. Okay, this is joint with uh, Xufeng Gao, who's now at Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, my colleague Ying Dong Lu, Mike Sharma, and Yoth Bosman is a, a student from the Netherlands. If we could go to the next chart. I'm just going to motivate this real quick. This actually is an example where we're dealing with dynamics. And so we're looking at a class of dynamic resource allocation problems. And I'll just describe this particular example, workforce sourcing. So imagine there's a company that needs to have a workforce that carries out and provides its services and products. One option for that sourcing is to use its own employees. That's the primary option. And now this, this option has the highest reward because its employees are the most skilled, they're the most capable, but they also cost the most. The next primary option uh, might be to use business partners. They don't have the same level of expertise, but their expertise is quite good. They don't cost as much, but the, the revenue that they, the uh, resource provide is not as high as well. And then let's say there's a secondary option, which are, are contractors that, again, uh, provide valuable service, but it's not the same level of um, quality, and it, uh, but it costs less. The other thing with contractors and business partners is they will learn as they do the work. And if it's your own employees, the learning stays within your company. If it's business partners or contractors, that learning is actually something that um, the other companies gain and not necessarily yourself. So um, just wanted to, to illustrate this particular problem. What we're going to do is when there's going to be a single demand, so there's just a single product, if you will, and we're going to determine what's the optimal number of employees uh, or uh, optimal uh, primary option one, optimal primary option two, and so on, and then the primary uh, secondary option. So at one extreme, there's the highest reward, but the highest cost. At the other extreme, there's the lowest reward, but also the lowest cost. And, uh, and what follows, I'm just going to focus on 
a, a prime, one primary and one secondary. So let's scroll forward. Next chart, this is just energy aware computing example. Next chart. Network bandwidth, same thing. Next chart. Uh, so I'm just going to describe the model. I'm going to quickly explain our solution, and then I'd like to illustrate some, some results that we have. So imagine that the demand for this single type of resource is represented by Brownian motion. There's a drift B. So you can think of the drift as maybe there's a linearly increasing trend or linearly decreasing trend. And then there's the volatility that's captured by the Brownian motion. The reward for the primary, uh, so P sub T is the amount of primary allocation. Think of it as the amount of the demand that's satisfied by your primary resources. This is what you're trying to determine because the idea is that whatever demand is not satisfied by the primary resource, it'll be satisfied by the secondary resource. The reward is linear in the, so, so if I have more uh, uh, resources than demand, then I can only get reward up to the demand. If I have more demand than resources in the primary, I can only drive revenue up to the amount of primary resource I have. That's why the reward is R sub P times the minimum of P of T and D of T. D of T is the demand. The cost is linear, and similarly for the secondary allocation, except, as I said, whatever's left over, whatever demand hasn't been satisfied by the primary, um, it'll be satisfied by the secondary. So here, what, what is the key trade-off here? If I have more resources than demand, then I'm incurring cost without driving the revenue. If I have more demand than primary resource, then there's a, a, a revenue that's been lost. There was an opportunity for me to satisfy more demand with my primary resource, which again has the highest reward, and I've lost on that. So there's either lost reward or incurred costs with having the primary being too large or too small. Next chart. Um, these are just details of the mathematical model. Let's skip over this. Next chart. This is just the mathematical formulation. So the mathematical formulation, just let me go through it intuitively, or in fact, focus on the, the words. We're trying to maximize the profit over some horizon. It's discounted because it's an infinite horizon. Don't worry about that. We're trying to maximize the profit, which is the, the reward from the primary resource. R sub P of T minus the cost for the primary resource, C sub P of T, plus the reward from the secondary minus the reward, uh, minus the cost for the secondary. The next two terms are every time I increase the primary, I'm going to incur a cost, which has a, a rate of I sub P. And every time I decrease the primary, I'm going to incur a cost that's denoted by D sub uh, P. Let's go to the next chart. I'm just going to explain what this policy is. Based upon the parameters of the model, the cost, um, the, the, the uncertainty, based upon all the parameters of the model, we identify an interval L and U, the lower and the upper level of the interval. And the optimal policy, this is a control policy. So whenever the difference between the primary resource at time t the primary resource allocation at time t and the demand at time t, whenever the difference between the two is within that interval, I do nothing. Whenever I'm outside the interval, let's say I'm above, I push down as hard as I can. That's uh, uh, theta sub L. Whenever I'm below the interval, I'm below L, I push up as fast as I can to get inside the L. So the control policy with the question that was asked earlier about dynamics, here the the policy is dynamically updating your position in the primary resource allocation to make sure it's always within L and U. Now, why don't we skip through, uh, th 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 that's what this theorem is about. We can skip through the next few charts. They just provide technical details that I, I, I'll skip over because we're at the hour. But I do want to just go over, keep going. I do want to show some empirical results. Keep going. This is the movie version of the presentation. <laughs> Keep going. 
keep going, keep going. Okay, so let me stop. Uh, okay, go back one. So here I'm going to use different approaches and let's not worry about that. But the black line is actually the, the, the forecast. This is the trend line that was extracted from data as a forecast of the demand. The, the other lines you're seeing are, are the actual demand that was realized and how the, uh, the different policies uh, uh, tried to satisfy that demand. Next chart. The main thing I want to point out here is the, the red uh, plot represents the Brownian motion. That's the demand. The blue and the magenta line, those are methods that are essentially offline optimal policies. So you would imagine that an offline policy should do better, but the offline policy discretizes the problem. As you can see, the, 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 um, the, the bar-like uh, structure, the step-like structure, and the demand is, the, the allocation is fixed within that interval. And um, the problem is that there's still uncertainty within that interval. And you can see the green line, which is our solution, is actually doing a much better job satisfying that red demand than either the blue or the magenta. Next chart. You can skip this. This, this is just showing that we actually get tremendous benefits, 50%, uh, 100% benefits. You can keep going against different versions of the problem. Okay, so to just summarize, this is actually a, a, a very simple problem in terms of stating it. There's Brownian motion demand, and you're trying to figure out how much primary resource to satisfy that demand. And we can prove mathematically that the optimal policy is to determine this interval L and U and always maintain your primary allocation within uh, this interval. We've extended these results to have more than one primary as the example I gave earlier. Um, but this method works extremely well. In fact, when we presented this work initially, our colleagues in the cloud computing area were very excited about allocating it and using it to uh, address their problems. So let me step here. I know I went through it very, very quickly. I do apologize for the problems at the beginning of the presentation, but I'm more than happy to continue to answer questions. Okay, so now we have a few questions. So let's start with the, the first one. It is given by Dr. Sukanda. What are the protocols for updating stochastic networks so that continuously changing conditions are assessed in real life situations? For example, such networks are heavily used in assessment of important structures subjected to hazards, which may change conditions of the system before, during, and after they happen. I, I think that's a, a really great question. I, I think that um, the, the approach that we took in the first part was really a static, you, you, you tell me the parameters or, or, or the, the, the environment in which uh, this stochastic network is characterized, and I'll tell you what the optimal solution is. So one way, because the, our approach is extremely efficient, it can be used in real time where there are machine learning methods detecting uh, in fact, this is often referred to um, as drift. Um, so if there's a slow change in the environment in terms of the uncertainty, uh, covariate drift, that's something that can be detected. And once that's detected, our solution can be used to uh, solve uh, what the, how the problem should, uh, what, what the resources should be changed to. There's also more abrupt changes where change point detection is used to check and see how the environment is changing. But that approach is really more, the first approach is more of a static planning type of approach. It's efficient enough to be used in real time, but the way you characterize the network, you don't wanna have a situation where you're always behind. Um, you probably want to be able to forecast what the near-term future is going to be and then solve that problem for that near-term future. Be if it's computing resources, it can be moved around quickly, so the time scale can be fast. If it's human resources, there's a, a lag, a time it takes that you want to change the allocation and how long it takes you to, to do that realization. And so when things can happen more dynamically, 
it would be the second approach that I described and that type of control policy that one would use as opposed to the first. I, I hope that answers the question. I hope it does. And uh, there is one more question. Can you shed some light on how to deal with epistemically and aleatory uncertainties? Uh, what type of uncertainties? Aleatory and epistemically uncertainties. uncertainties. Um, I mean, could the, could the person that asked the question give me an example so that I can better speak to it? Dr. Suganda, if you're... Yeah, hi, Dr. Mark. Yes. Uh, so it's epistemic and aleatory uncertainties. Um, um, sorry, I'm a civil engineer, so usually we have two types of uh, uncertainties in our systems. Uh, one is epistemic, which factors we know may cause uncertainties, but we don't know exactly how much they affect the system. And aleatory okay. are the ones which uh, we have no idea about. So if you have if you have any idea of how to deal with those, just sure. Want to know. Sure. So, no, I mean, I'm familiar with the concepts of the different types of uncertainties. I just wanted to make sure I would answer it in, in a way that would be most effective. Um, it, the, I, I do think that um, the, 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 the work I'm focused on more is on the decision making side. So the, the characterization of the uncertainties is where I really rely on subject matter experts. So I just want to highlight the point that subject matter experts are extremely important. You can look at the data, but there are people that have knowledge and information that can help you interpret the data better. And I think that's one way to uh, try to better understand the uncertainties and, and modeling them. Particularly when you're dealing with human resources, I, I, I gave the example earlier on where people tend to change how quickly they work depending upon how busy the system is. In terms of things like, um, let, let's just uh, point to the pandemic and all of the supply chain issues that, that occurred. Uh, that's a perfect example where th people were optimizing things even up to, you know, maybe 99.999 percentile of risk but things can happen that uh in your second category that you can anticipate and that's where i think there needs to be a form of resilience in the solution there needs to be something that says if the forecast is not off by 20 percent but something catastrophic happens you don't want to so so what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a so much inventory that you handle that because that would just be way too costly. On the other hand, you do want to have a strategy that if something truly unexpected and a risk that you never could have anticipated occurs, you're able to mitigate that and handle that. So I think they're, they're different. I think the solutions I'm talking about now are where you can model the uncertainty. You can run the models with different assumptions to look at the entire solution space from an uncertainty perspective because your forecasts are only estimates and you want to get be better understand the decision space but then you want to have a resilient strategy something that handles the situation where things completely change it's not just the parameters of your model change it's that the model itself changes and i think that's a separate issue that needs to be dealt with so it's like uh, having a fail safe uh, to fail safe uh, backup plans for anything that we're designing. I, I do think that that's important because again, uh, I don't know what happened in India, but in the US um, when, when the pandemic started, uh, you couldn't buy toilet paper for some yeah, reason. Yeah, 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 I was there when it happened. Right. So, so my point <laughs> is you, you, can't, you can't have enough toilet paper in the store to handle that. But uh, yeah, because I, it would just be paying for too much. But once that happened, you needed to be able to resolve it quickly. That that's what you needed, and that's what, uh -huh. not, what didn't exist in the U.S. at least. Okay, thank you. 
professor gupta i think professor gupta has a question but can we use the, this type of modeling in uh, stock market prediction also because there are so many uncertainties in stock markets uh yes yes it's interesting um so one of the projects that we actually did um where we developed a a stochastic dynamic program solution to trading problem we actually worked with some a, a company that um actually traded in commodities and we developed the solution for them um and and two things were interesting one was we actually shadowed a trader to really watch and understand how he operated happened to be a, a man who had many years of experience so we learned from that and we tried to incorporate that in our solution the other thing was much like i was just describing our solution was something that the trader could run the model under different assumptions and see how it affected um his uh his, his uh, thought process and his actions where the solution really provided value was not so much what should i do today he was very familiar with the markets he was very seasoned he understood what he needed to do today but what he did today could influence what would happen say later in the week or later than the next week and that was something where these tools provided headlights and guidance that he didn't have in his head he could figure out what the right thing to do was today but how that influenced the future and maybe he should trade more or less because of opportunities that are arising in the future that's where these tools were helpful for him thank you thank you mark thank you mark. thank you so much most welcome thank you dean sir thank you dr mark uh the we have one more question from dr saurav shivasta how effective is interval optimization to deal with uncertainty oh that's a very very good point um i i think it can be it can be very very effective um the problem is so this whole area of robust optimization and using intervals and and optimizing over the intervals it it really depends upon how uncertain the uncertainty is and i don't mean that as a joke first of all you need to figure out what the 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 interval is and if the interval is very very large um you could be choosing a worst case solution um that is much worse than it need be so what what we've been trying to do is a combination of a stochastic model uh and maybe something where the parameters of the model vary over an interval trying to understand that interval and again solving the problem for varying uh interval sizes because maybe it's not sensitive to that there may be certain parameters that the solution is really not sensitive to it other parameters where it's extremely sensitive to it and that that's also another useful thing because that can be a feedback loop to the people that do predictive analytics to say look i don't really need an accurate model for this aspect uh, an accurate uh, predictor for this parameter or this part of the model but there's another part of the model that i really need some the the model to be very very accurate so then they can focus on those aspects as well okay thank you so much sir now we take a few questions from kush why is the appropriate position of the curvature more important than the accuracy does it have to ah. do with the nature of problem Yes so let's imagine let let's imagine my uh my model gives me a v shape um so that the minimum uh so in other words my optimal solution under a, a very crude predictive model gives me a v shape and so the optimum is at that the bottom of the v now let's imagine that i get a a much more accurate model that is like a basin it has a very very flat area um that intersects with that point of the v but it actually winds up uh having a slow slope to the right so that the minimum under this very accurate predictive model accurate say within a few percentage points it it's giving me a minimum that's very far away from that v point if it turns out that that v the bottom of that v point is really where the minimum is that crude predictive model gave me a better solution than the very detailed model and so by curvature 
what I'm talking about is having the model bend at the right place relative to your decision variable, if that makes sense. Okay, so thank you so much. The next question is, as discussed, the actions which we will take when we are within the LU interval or below above it, but why is the criteria for selection for L and U? Also, why is L always less than U? Oh, uh, yeah, so so it's it's L is for the lower part of the interval, U is for the upper part of the interval. The values of L and U are actually solved, are, are, are functions of the parameters of the model. I didn't get a chance to go through that. Um, but if, if the uncertainty is uh, higher, that interval might be wider. If the uncertainty is lower, the interval may be more narrow. So it really does depend. And you can imagine that you could even update L and U um, based upon the dynamics of what you're observing. So your estimates of L and U are things that could be adjusted. In fact, the example that I gave, the L and U are updated because the demand forecast was uh, had different uh, drift parameters over the, the time horizon. Thank you, Doctor. I think, Ankush, that answers your questions. And now I'll move on to the next question by Professor Vivek. Can we train a Boltzmann machine by using the model, by using this model? Uh, I, it's an interesting question. It's not something I've looked at, so uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I do think it's an interesting question, and, and uh, uh, certainly worth considering. I'm more than happy to send you papers if you're interested, uh, and it is something I'll think more about, but it's not something we've looked at. Sure, so thank you so much. Now, continuing on the previous question by Ankush, Bhavya adds on this. So does the optimal number of parameters lie within the LU interval? The optimal number of parameters. Um, oh, so, so let me try to clarify and see if this answers the question. The decision is to, to the, the decision variable is P of T. In other words, how many primary resources do I have at time T? And as T changes, I can either just stay and do nothing, in which case P of T stays fixed, or I can increase P of T or decrease P of T. Um, D of T is the demand. So D of T is the realization of the demand. I take the difference between the two. So P of T minus D of T is telling me how much larger or smaller my position in the primary uh, resource is relative to the demand at each point in time T. I take that difference and I want to make sure that difference is within L and U. Whenever P minus D, P T minus D T is below L, I need to increase my P of T so that the difference is within L and U. Similarly, when I'm above, so P of T minus D of T is greater than U, I want to push down. I want to decrease my P of T so that the difference between P of T and D of T is within L and U. So yes, the parameter, the, the decision variable is constantly changing according to that control policy, which is dynamic in nature. The dynamics are coming from the, the demand as a function of time. OK, thank you so much. Bhavya, I hope that answers your question. Oh, there is one more. So I imagine L would be at very least need to be, at the very least, need to be positive for profitable scenarios. Well, that's an interesting point. Uh, yes, so uh, let's imagine that L is negative. Uh, in other words, I can have the demand be greater than the uh, primary, um, that may be a viable solution. And the reason is it could be too costly to always make sure my P of T is greater than D of T. But if it's not too costly, imagine the cost for increasing P of T is negligible. Then I would agree with you. I think you would be in a situation where your primary, uh, the P of T, the primary resources is always greater than the demand. But again, the cost for increasing or decreasing your P of T is something that might make it be too costly 
to always track the demand. And therefore, your L might be negative. In fact, it typically is for problems where there is a cost for, it, for increasing and decreasing. Does that clarify? Thank you so much, Doctor. Yes, that clarifies her query. Now we can move on to the next question. Bahimanshu, can we use fuzzy techniques to minimize uncertainties in this type of modeling? Um, I think you can. So in the first category, which is simulation based, um, as I said, you can put as much complexity in, in, in the simulation as possible. And certainly fuzzy techniques could be used here. I think in the second case, um, the, the analysis is very, very simple. But I think it provides a very simple policy that's very powerful. So for example, the analysis was based on Brownian motion and several other things. We eliminated the Brownian motion and did simulations uh, with much more complicated things. In fact, the results I showed was actually for trace data in a network. So it was real data. It wasn't Brownian motion. It wasn't uh, uh, any of these uh, simplified analytical assumptions. And it still provided very good values. I think where fuzzy could be useful in the second case is maybe in terms of estimating the L and U uh, and the uncertainties associated with that. So yes, I think it can play a role in both cases. OK, thank you so much, sir. I think that answers your question, Himanshu. Now I'd be asking the audience if there are any more questions. OK, we have one more question. And the way uncertainties our LNU interview interval would be too large. Is that a good thing? Uh, it, it's a very good question. I think if the LNU interval is very large, um, well, it, it could be due to the uncertainties, but it could also be due to the cost. Um, there, there are results here that I didn't show, which are um they're in the the presentation i just didn't have time to go through them if the cost to decrease the uh number of primary resources is higher than the cost the, the the poor performance you're you're obtaining with what you currently have then you wouldn't decrease so there can be situations where there's just an l or just a u and it has to do not only on the uncertainties, but also the cost. Um, if the cost is very high for making changes, then you really want to be sure that increasing or decreasing is the right thing to do. You don't want to be increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing because you're incurring costs that you would have been better off just staying where you are. And that's another reason why the, the L and U interval could be large. So the L and U interval, you can think of it as, as hedging. And in fact, uh, I, I didn't have a chance to mention it, but if you were to task the problem we looked at in a supply chain type of framework, the L and U represent a form of safety stock, or I should say an inventory model. The idea of keeping some inventory on hand that's above the expected demand because you're trying to have a safety stock against demand that might go above the average. You can think of the L and U in that way. That's the type of role it's playing. So it's uncertainty, but it's also cost. Thank you so much, Doctor. So this is my final call. Are there any more questions from the audience? I guess there are none. Uh, Dr. Mark, are there any more slides that you might that you want to take up? Maybe? No, one. I I just want to thank you all for this opportunity, and uh, the questions are great. I I want to just emphasize how important I think decision making under uncertainty is. It's it's wonderful from uh from the range of pure mathematics all the way to really important real world problems. And I hope uh, you have opportunities to work in the area. And I wish you all very well. Thank you so much. Now, on behalf of CMG UIT chapter, I would like to talk, thank Dr. Mark for taking out his valuable time and providing us with an insightful session today. I would also like to thank everyone else for being an active and wonderful audience. Distinguished speaker seminar will continue to conduct such presentations. So I hope for your positive responses in the future. Thank you so much.
I think Professor Segal wants to speak. Uh, Segal, sir. You are on mute. You are on mute, sir. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It's, uh, this, is the first, uh, this is the first talk organized by the Siam chapter of GYT. And uh, the, the, the wonderful question has been asked, and it leads to so many open problems and possible solutions. And uh, I hope in future we can impact on such uh, kind of activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, the presence. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. And again, if anyone's interested in papers, uh, just let me know. I can have them sent. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, everyone, indeed, uh, we are going to end this meeting. Thank you, Segal, sir. Thank you, Dean, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining.